there's the a PDF copy of this Jose, I'm assuming that's how you say it, Jose et al. 2008 paper. Um, so what I'm expecting you to do is not read all 26 pages very closely because not all 26 pages are relevant to us, nor will they make sense. So the, the kind of reading I'm expecting you to do this week is to say, okay, the very first words of this article are, we present UBVRI CCD photometry of this open cluster. Fabulous. This is a gold mine for what we're doing because we are going to be getting J, H, and K, and Y's photometry of this region, which are all longer wavelengths than I. And so if they can give us UBVRI photometry, that's fabulous because that's going to help us a lot in understanding what the nature of the sources are that we're looking at. Um, so they're going on talking about the aim of studying its basic properties such as the amount of interstellar extinction, distance, age, stellar contents, and initial mass function. So let's look at that. They're laying out sort of their table of contents. Interstellar extinction is going to matter for us eventually, but not at this time. So you don't need to care about interstellar extinction. Distance is useful. Age is useful. Stellar contents is useful. Initial mass function not so much, but we should still kind of pay attention to that because that could be a scientific justification for why we want to study this region. It was a primary motivation for them and why they wanted to study this region. Um, it could be folded into what we're talking about as well, but, you know, make a note, uh, again, in your collection of notes, this is an important paper. It's got broadband optical photometry of the point sources. It's got a distance and an age estimate, and it's got an initial mass function discussion. So they're going through here, you know, here is where, you know, they're talking about the mass function stuff. It's not going to make any sense to you. It only vaguely makes sense to me because that's not my primary science. Don't worry about understanding every single thing, okay? This is another important thing. A significant number of young stars are distributed among a nebulous stream toward the east side of the cluster. That's also important because that we saw in the wise images. So we want to know whether or not those objects are the things that we're seeing in the wise images. In other words, if they've already discovered the things that we think we see in the images. So and you can go through and read, um, the, you know, scan the introduction. And they're talking about the IMF, why it matters, why they think it's important. Read it if you want, that's great, but don't worry about understanding everything. The details of the data processing and reduction, not so important for us right now. This figure, very important because it's showing us where they're working. That is a footprint of where they have data. This is that stock eight cluster just right there. This is that nebulous stream, which they see faintly in this optical image, but we see very uh, prominently in the wise images. And so the cluster that they're talking about is right here, which is good because we're seeing point sources all along this tail. So this suggests to me that they have not done everything in this region that we can do. In other words, there's lots of discovery space left. Can I ask you something? Yeah. So, can you go back to that? Sure. So in this area, this broad area right here, just the circle that the, is what they're really doing the, their studies on? No, they're doing, um, they're, they, so the solid line is where they have broadband optical data. Um, so what they're saying here is that this is an R-band image in the background, so it's optical. The area marked with thin lines is where they got slitless spectroscopy. In other words, they have H-alpha information on this. H-alpha is one of those things that young stars tend to have. We will talk more about this in the weeks and months to come. Um, but the thick lines is where they have the broadband UBVI uh, photometry. And then they're identifying, they're defining their terms for what they're going to talk about in the rest of the paper. So they did some work in the stock 8 cluster that's here. They identified this nebulous stream, and they're claiming that this circle right here, it says, represents the location of the small embedded cluster. So they are identifying a small cluster in this region. So they have data over this whole region, but the things, the landmarks that they're going to talk about are the stock 8 cluster this nebulous stream and this embedded cluster that they that they've discovered. Okay. Okay. I should have said at the beginning. I obviously can't see your faces. So if you have something to ask, stop me, please, 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 please oh, stop. Let, let me go back to that. I hate to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so we don't look at stock eight, and we don't look at the nebulous stream. We're going to be looking at all of it because the first thing that we need to do, well. 
we're going to, what we're doing in, in looking at this literature is we're trying to assess what information these people and others have in this region. So it's not that we want to avoid stock eight in this embedded cluster because we have useful information to add to what they have. It's more like, um, so a teacher several years ago um, described this entire process of looking for YSOs as sort of like a detective show or a mystery novel where you're trying to identify the suspects. Okay, Somebody else has already interrogated them and taken some notes. Before we go and interrogate them, we need to know what the other cops found out about these suspects. Oh, I got you. Okay. So they might not have done something with uh, infrared. Right. They did JH and K, but they didn't have WISE data. Okay. So scrolling down, they have a log of observations table. Yeah, so what? Um, they have stuff about their calibration. Yep, I'm sure they all did a good job, but we don't care about it right now. Table 2, UBVI photometric data. This is the gold mine. The complete table is available in electronic form only, which means that we can download it from that FTP site that I quickly clicked on just to show you that it exists before. This is photometry for everything that they found in that footprint region from whatever figure that was back here. In, that, in this, the, the outline of the big thick region, that is everything in, where did it go, table two, wherever it went, table two. So it's only showing five sources. It turns out that this catalog has 7,000 sources in it. So I actually downloaded this earlier because I fortunately had a couple of meetings canceled. Thank God for that. So if we go and look at this thing that you can download from the FTP site, it is a big data table. It is a very large data table. It has, like I said, oh, almost 8,000 sources. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so some photometry you can get right off of SIMBAD or something. So if we were to plug in these coordinates for some of these objects in this region, um, this table is better than that? Yes, because this is the source of the data table. If you pull it off of SIMBAD, you're relying on SIMBAD having ingested it properly. But this okay. is the original source. So it's like a game of telephone, right? The original people took the data and published it, and you have to rely that they published it correctly. And then Simbad is yet another step removed where they had to ingest the data, right? And, and, right. and this is just going back to the source. Gotcha. Because Simbad is notorious for having inaccuracies in some of the stuff that they ingest. So it, it's... If you want to be careful about it, if you, <laughs> you really do need to go back to the original source. Okay. So they're, they're in this... Of course. Yeah. Um, if you go back to the data over there, um, as I look at the columns there, the columns are filled up at the top part here, but if you scroll down to the bottom part of the table, you start seeing some of the columns disappearing with numbers. Yep. Is that because they just have the point sources and they don't have the data for those? So the columns are, so there's the star number, right ascension, declination, and then um, it looks like this is V, U minus B, B minus V, V minus I. So what this means is they have a V magnitude for it, and they have an I magnitude for it, because they have, it's a V minus I column, but they don't have U, B, or U or B, right? Because in order to have a U minus B, you have to have a U and a B, but they don't have it, so it's blank. And then B minus V um, is this column. And they have a V, but they don't have a B. So that column is empty. So it's basically saying that they have two data points, two photometric data points for this object, a V and an I, but not a U or a B. Okay. Would this be because it didn't show up in the U and the B? Yes. Or would there be some other reason? It, it means that it wasn't detected in the U and B frames that they have which makes sense given the shape of the SED, which, you know, we'll get to eventually, but I don't know if you remember what the SEDs look like in the short wavelength, but they plunge fast. They fall off really fast, and so it is not at all surprising. It is very, very common to find objects that are only detected at the longer wavelengths and not at the shorter wavelengths. Okay. Okay. So continuing on um, through our... Our, our critical but fast reading of this manuscript. So in, in your notes file, 
notebook or, or hard copy or electronic, you make a note, table two is fabulous, go and get it, <laughs> okay? And table three, eh, you know, they're, they're talking about IMF stuff. Archival data, they're using JH and K, which is what we're going to use from 2MASS. Um, they used MSX and IRAS. But, um, so in, in your metaphorical or physical notes, you can say, using MSX and IRAS data. And then later on in the paper, we'll paper will find out exactly how they're using it, whether they're using it for point sources or not. And if you actually read the paragraph here, it says the MSX images were used to study the emission from the PAHs. PAHs are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, rings of carbon, also found like the grunge on your grill are also PAHs. Um, they're find it, found everywhere in the universe, oldest galaxies, comets, and everything in between. Um, so they're telling us here that they're not doing the point sources with MSX. They're only doing the extended emission. And the same for IRAS. They're using, the spa using it for the spatial distribution of dust color temperature. Again, they're using it to, to look at the distribution of dust, not the point sources. Okay. So then they're talking about the stellar surface density and cluster size, not so relevant to us right now. Reddening in the cluster, not so relevant to us right now. They're talking about how they're deriving it, blah, blah, blah. Optical color magnitude diagrams. Now it's time to start reading more closely again. They go through and they start talking about, you know, this is actually plotting up the data from that massive catalog in the beginning. And they then they describe in the text how they're going to statistically clean it, blah, 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 so they can try to statistically identify what's field and what's cluster. Again, not so relevant for us right now or even downstream because if you know they're not identifying specific objects, if they're only identify if they're only doing it statistically, um, we can't compare our results with theirs very closely. But they also reference a table that appeared early appeared earlier in the text here, table four, coordinates and photometric data of detected H alpha emission stars. What that means is they think those things are the young stars. Okay, so in your notes, you can write table four, list of young stars, go and get table four. And in fact, I did, table four is here. And if I go and look at it, it's of course much shorter. It's only 25 sources. But those are the things, this is, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is the tip of things that other people have identified as young stars in this region. So this is important. Um, so going back to where it refers, where it appears in the text. Um, so they're talking about, you know, luminosity functions, mass functions, again, not so relevant to us. Near infrared color, color, and color magnitude diagrams. You can tell that it's a British journal because they spell color wrong. Um, so again, this is the kind of thing we're going to be doing um, because we are going to have near infrared and we're going to do color and color diagrams. So we don't need to read this very closely right now, but we will eventually. So here is where they're determining what the ages are of these things, relevant downstream, relevant to the proposal. Because we can say here that this paper is estimating an age of this thing of about 2 million years. Okay, so in your notes, then that's an important thing to say, estimated age of about 2 million years. Then section 8 on the initial mass function, we do not care about that at all. Lots and lots and lots of verbiage and plots, not relevant at all. Section 9, embedded cluster in the nebulous stream. This one is also, this section is also worth looking at very closely. And table 6 here is a list of O and B stars. So OB in this context really does mean um, O stars and B stars. In other words, very young, very bright stars that are probably powering the nebulosity in this region. So there are 13 sources, and they have helpfully given us references. So those are additional an additional trail of breadcrumbs that we're going to need to follow. It is entirely likely that those sources are, or those references are in the 36 reference list that we found in Simbad, but we need to check. So we'll need to go and chase those references. So in your notebook, make a note. Go and chase Georgeland, Georgeland, and Rue, and Meyer, and Macaque, and Savage. But here's the list of 13 sources, and they have helpfully made this information also available electronically. So that one, too, is available, and I've got that one there. Okay. 
So uh, the embedded cluster, they go through and say, well, this is what we found, and this is why we think it is actually part of this cluster. So if you read this closely, you'll find that they that other people in the literature mentioned this source, but they suggested that it was not associated by, with IC417, that it was in fact some, something much, much further away, much further away. And they are concluding here that the young stars associated with the nebula stream in fact cannot be at 21 kiloparsecs. It's got to be a whole lot closer, and it's got to be really closer to two kiloparsecs um, that their, you know, the distance that they've derived here. And so Ivanov et al. 2005 also seems to be a paper that we should track down. So make a note, go and chase Ivanov 2005 and figure out, because they are also studying the, these things in the nebula stream, that we need to find out what else these people were reporting about it. Section 10, distribution of gas and dust. We do not care. Okay, lots and lots of stuff about MSX and IRAS. Not a lot of things we can use. This is useful showing the spatial distributions of OB stars, the H-alpha emitters, and the IR excess sources that they've identified here. So this is really useful. There's the nebula stream, right? And there's this is stock 8 in here, and that's an enlargement of that region. And so they're finding H-alpha emitters, or sorry, IR excess stars, actually quite far away. This is good, at least from the from our perspective, because we gonna we want to study a larger region than this. And the fact that they're finding young stars all the way out here gives us some expectation that we will find some stars even further away from this cluster. Um, now they're talking about what is that nebulous stream, and they're talking about could it be this, could it be that. Here is all of the data that we have to bear on this, and then there's some really interesting stuff in here on what they think is going on, where the stars are that are powering it. And it's interesting. Um, I, you know, we should spend some time reading it. Um, there are some additional narrow band images of this region, and then they have they spin a story. They say, okay, this is what we think is going on. This is what we think formed first. This is what we think formed second. And they even think that the, the there's a third generation of stars that they can find. So that's interesting too. Um, not something that we can necessarily spin into the proposal, maybe, but it's worth reading a little bit. And then they summarize what they found. So this is going to be, I think, the meatiest paper of what we have. But you see how I was skipping fast section of it. We don't care about the extended emission. We don't care about the mass function. We're trying to get the information on the point sources out.